So as we're all waiting for people to load in uh, to today's talk, I'm kind of watching the numbers go up uh, at the bottom of my screen. Um, I'll just do a quick welcome uh, to everybody and thank you for being here. We'll get started in just another minute or less. So the talk that we are hosting this afternoon uh, is on vernacular photography. And this is a, a, a broad term to um, sort of encompass what we might call amateur photography, found photographs. Um, it's really, it's a, it's a catch all phrase of sorts, um, but one that has really gained currency in the larger history of photography in the last several decades. Um, I think in, in my estimation by the late 90s, photo historians were really acknowledging that photography is a lot more than the so-called masters that we like to think of um, as the people who defined and filled the history books up until that point. And so the, um, the field really started to grow um, by really embracing sort of all forms of photography and with it, gave rise to this idea of vernacular photography and really gave rise to a lot of um, a lot of wonderful images and smaller stories within the history of photography that um, have have just become very vital to the conversation that um, that we share today uh, with photography in general. Um, the talk is going to be led by our two uh, panelists. Uh, Lisa Volpe and Barbara Levine. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about each of them now uh, for those of you who may not know um, them or their background. So Barbara Levine is an artist, uh, photography collector, and an author. Uh, her collection of early vernacular photograph albums was acquired by the International Center of Photography, the ICP, in New York in 2009. Since 2014, Barbara and Paige Ramey have regularly organized exhibitions for Cherryhurst House in Houston, including Camera Era, whose catalog was awarded Best Photo Book by Photo Eye. Trained as a photographer at the San Francisco Art Institute, by, um, followed by a graduate degree in museology, Ms. Levine served as the deputy director for the Contemporary Jewish Museum in San Francisco and as exhibitions director at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. Lisa Volpe, our other panelist, is the Associate Curator of Photography at the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. She earned her MA at Case Western Reserve University and her PhD at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Before arriving in Houston, she was the curator of the Wichita Art Museum, where she oversaw all areas of the museum's collection. Additionally, she held various curatorial roles at the Santa Barbara Museum of Art and fellowships at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art and the Cleveland Museum of Art. Her current project, Georgia O'Keeffe Photographer, examines the little known trove of artistic photographs created by O'Keeffe in the latter half of her career. With that, I will go ahead and turn the stage over to Lisa and Barbara. Thank you both. Thank you, Scott. Let me see. I just want to make sure everyone can see the thumbs up. We're good. Yep. Looks good. Um, well, I'm just thrilled to be here with you. Um, and the Museum of Fine Arts Houston is absolutely proud to be the home of the Barbara Levine and Paige Ramey photography collection, an exceptional cache of more than of approximately, Barbara might correct me here, 5,000 prints and photographic objects that together call attention to the significance of photography in our everyday lives. And among the visual arts, photography obviously has the widest embrace. It is present in a thousand different forms. And as Scott mentioned, it's from the pinnacles of high art to those humble snapshots. 
And as a museum that aims to represent the entire history of photography, we were thrilled um, to be presented with the opportunity to acquire this, uh, this collection. And we're really proud to become the first institution to acquire more than just a limited amount or examples here and there of this everyday photography, but we are the first to acquire a vernacular collection in its entirety. Um, so from dignified portraits taken in makeshift studios to commemorative handmade photo albums or scrubbed and polished pets in the front yard or kisses transformed into visual lasting keepsakes, the works in this collection underscore photography's role as a record keeper of our personal lives and of our broader social history. And these captured moments, both big and small, have endured. And in today's rapidly changing digital world, they have become comforting touchstones to the past. And we all know we're certainly living in unprecedented times. We can't wait for 2020 to be over. But it's photography that often best conveys our perpetual hope for the future, our resilience in the face of change, and those common experiences that unite us. And that's one thing that is so special about this collection. Now, as Scott mentioned, vernacular is a tough term and Barbara and I have been back and forth about it quite a bit. Um, so we both actually kind of prefer to refer to the collection by the title that it's been given, Photomania, which we feel is so much better than the vague term vernacular. Because photomania conveys that joy and wonder of the objects, the passion and fascination with which Barbara and Paige built their collection over the past 30 years, and that emphasis on storytelling and commonality. Their collection celebrates our collective enthusiasm. It celebrates our photomania. And that collection, unlike any other vernacular collection we've seen, isn't characterized by that indiscriminate purchasing of just anything and everything. It's focused around a limited number of interwoven themes and includes unique examples of material that can't be located in any other private or public collection. And our plan at Museum of Fine Arts Houston is not to silo this collection, but to integrate it and to celebrate the interwoven qualities of the collection by interweaving it with our permanent collection. And so Barbara and I, you know, we were talking about this and we decided that we wanted to show how the collection interweaves by kind of formatting our um, presentation in that way. One object will lead us to another, to another, to another, and kind of wrap around back to the front. So we're gonna start with this and I will let Barbara, now that I've talked my head off, tell you what we're looking at here. Um, well, first, let me just give a shout out. Uh, thank you, Medium San Diego, for inviting Lisa and I to share this with you and um, to celebrate vernacular photography, which, of course, many of you know is my favorite subject, um, except for maybe dogs and tequila. Um, and um, I just want to give a shout out to uh, Paige Ramey and to um, you know, all of our friends in San Miguel and Houston and San Francisco and New York that may be watching this and also to Martin Vineski who, who designed that um, wonderful photomania button and who worked with us on camera era in, at Cherry Hurst House in Houston. Um, and also to Peter Stein, if you're out there for wordsmithing with us to come up with photomania. Um, so here we're looking at um, photo ID badges, which um, I love because, you know, in this age of, you know, uh, fingerprints and photo IDs, you know, there was a time when your photo ID was enough and uh, photo IDs came out of the history of sort of uh, ornamental um, jewelry, which was really common in Victorian times, mourning, like when people died, it was really common to wear a button or a badge with the deceased person's picture on it. And then um, 
photo IDs actually came about, no surprise, uh, through the military um, and through then, you know, passports and, and so on and so forth. And so these were sort of a way for employers to, um, well, you know, ID their employees. But what's so interesting about these now looking back is, is that they're like little time capsules. They're, they're like wearable time capsules. They're artifacts, you know, you have the, some of them can get quite ornate. They're about 30 or, I don't know, maybe, I don't even know how many are in the collection, um, but they can be, some of them can be made out of sterling silver. Some of them can have very ornate, almost jewel-like qualities. These are pretty straightforward. Um, ones with women are especially sought out by collectors because um, starting in the 40s, especially when women went to work. Um, and there, you know, you've got the, you've got the history of the company, you've got this person's life. Um, and then you've also got the, the, what we now see as the resemblance to mug shots. Um, you know, you can kind of see it in the second one. Um, you can, with the orange, the black man, you can kind of see it's almost like the numbering is almost like a, a mug shot, but there are other ones of, and then the Oregon shipbuilding, you can see that the woman with the height chart, it's very similar to what you would see in a mug shot. But um, so it's both advertising for the company, it's both an artifact of time and company history. And it really signals, um, you know, a time when having a photo ID was enough. And frankly, it's not enough anymore. Um, so I don't know, Lisa, do you have anything you want to say about these? Um, you, there are almost 50 in the collection. Um, I just did the count today. And I mean, they're so fantastic. And our hope, you know, in putting these side by side with other things from our permanent collection is to really think about the role of the portrait in everyday life, whether um, you carry it with you in your wallet um, as your driver's license or whether it's um, an artistic statement, but trying to make those, you know, more personal and human connections. Uh, wonderful, it's a wonderful part of the collection. Um, these are some of um, my favorite objects in the collection. They're um, embroidered postcards, which, you know, um, I think it's worth mentioning that there are many uh, photographers, contemporary photographers, who are rediscovering analog processes, but they're also rediscovering whether they are aware of it or not. Um, the history of people interacting with their photographs by embroidering or collaging or cutting out. Um, and it, it's, it's this impulse to want to make a photograph rather than take a photograph. And I think that these embroidered postcards, which kind of came about uh, primarily in France, Spain, and Portugal, um, these are commercial. Um, there are examples in the collection of personal ones that have been embroidered. Um, and the most popular, usually they were hand tinted, like you can see, and the most popular subject, sometimes they were beaded, you know, and the most popular subjects usually were matadors, gypsies, actresses, singers. Um, they're quite extraordinary. Um, if you think about, Silk, they're all with silk thread um, and just this impulse to want to embellish. And, and that, that was sort of an impulse early on from, from the very beginning of photography. And we'll see that in some other examples in the collection here today. But from the very first, whether it was, you know, hand tinting to make, to make it seem more human or alive or, or embroidering it. So to go from a two dimensional to a three dimensional image. Um, there are quite a few of these in the collection and we just, we just love them. I mean, to see them all together is, is quite powerful. 
Um, yeah, so, you know, again, I, I always try to show uh, artists that are interested in this photo textile combination, these, these early works. And, and I think um, just a point to say that that was one of the reasons that Paige and I really wanted to move the collection into a museum to a wider audience so that the people could see that this tradition with photography, um, well, they could see the tradition, I guess is what I'm trying to say, and, and, and feel part of it and be inspired of it. I mean, many people, when they see these, they say, oh, I remember those in you know, my grandmother's collection or something like that. And, and the light bulb goes off and the connections are made. And I don't know, some of you um, listening may even have your own stories, which I, I'm always interested in. And you know, putting on my curator hat for a second, one of the things that amazed us about these embroidered um, photo postcards was the freshness and the brightness of that thread. I mean, it has not faded in any way. Um, whatever you are seeing on your screen, it's brighter and more vibrant than that in person. They are incredible. And the, the detail of the handwork is just beyond. We've shared these with our um, uh, decorative arts and craft department, and they are just thrilled um, with you know, the handwork on these cards. They're so fantastic. I mean, that makes me uh, want to also add in that, you know, we're all taking most of our pictures digitally now. Um, and they're, you know, they will, I always say, become obsolete in our own lifetime because the technology changes so much. So when we're looking at things like this or the ID badges or other things, you know, you got to really take it in how these things have survived. I mean, these things that we're looking at, the, the, the now we're looking at photo esculturas, but the, 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 the embroidered postcards, those are like 1910, 1920. And like Lisa, you were saying, they're so bright. They, the, the photographs have lasted, the silk thread has lasted. And I think that's one of the draws of this material for people. It's like, oh my gosh, something that actually has lasted through decades. So these are photo esculturas. Uh, we have a lot of these in the collection, a personal favorite of mine that um, I was introduced to these by um, a wonderful woman in San Miguel de Allende, Jennifer Haas, um, who has an incredible collection of these. And I just am in love with them. They photo escultura in Spanish means literally photo sculpture. So they are three dimensional um, uh, representations of people that have passed away um, as their ceremonial objects, their memory objects. They are amazing in the way that they are handcrafted. Usually what would happen is that uh, somebody, they would either People would either go to the studio in Mexico City, which is where I believe, um, I could be wrong, that this craft originated. They would go to the studio in Mexico City, they would give a likeness of the person, a photograph to the carver, to the craftsperson, and then they would make these, eff these effigies. Um, and then in the United States, because so many uh, Mexicans and Texans fought um, you know, in the United States, they would, there would be, there would be salesmen that would go around to the homes and they would offer this service. And so the, the, the one of the soldier in, in the bottom right is an example of that, um, that photo escultura came from, I don't know who made it, but the person was identified as somebody whose family lived in Texas. Um, so there's a lot that can be said about these. Um, they merge traditions of craft and photography. They were commissioned um, for special occasions, most often as you know, uh, remembrances. 
the thing that's so fascinating is that um, Mexicans have a very different relationship to death than uh, Americans do. Um, so these would be right at home on top of the television set or on a place of pride in, you know, in a room so that the feeling was that the person was with them. Um, so they have a kind of haunting power um, and they're not made anymore. I mean, I, I think that there's probably some version um, and I, I know that I've seen in some um, exhibitions, like in Mexico City, there was a wonderful exhibition of the work of Graziella E. Gerbidi, and she had commissioned some photo esculturas with another artist whose name I'm, but I, I think these have such a draw that you just, you, you want to go there, you want to imagine, well, what would it be like if I got a photo escultura of somebody who passed that really meant a lot to me or anyway um yeah and these are incredibly detailed in person you know the clothing is not just kind of a flat plane it is dimensional so like the collars are at a different level than the shirt um the one on the bottom left um he has this incredible spotted tie on they're really really fantastic and if you grew up in the US, your touchstone for what these are sort of like is more like the thing on the right side of the screen, um, the statuettes. And if you were like me and kind of played peewee soccer, sometimes it was an option to get your um, portrait kind of cut out and it slid into that strange wooden stand. Um, well, this is a tradition that goes back pretty far in the US, these strange cutout um, portraits, and this is by far my favorite one in the collection, just because it's so wacky weird. Um, Barbara, do you want to talk about this one? Well, they are called Statuettes of Humanettes, and um, I had the pleasure of, um, of buying this from a dealer I uh, just adore, Stacy Waldman, House of Mirth. Um, she has an incredible eye, and um, so I love this because it's very different. Most humanists or statuettes, they, they have a little stand with a slot. This one, uh, uh, May 1920s, um, you know, the Orientalism type dress, it's the thing on the head, you know, that you would hang it that's so unusual. I had never really ever seen uh, one of those like that. So. Again, you know, if you're thinking about immortal keepsakes, I, I don't know that I would go to the, well, let's hang her on the wall. Um, uh, I, will, I will add that the photo escultures that we're looking at, some of them can get quite ornate with the jewelry that's been added on. And these are more plain than some of them. Um, so again, you know, this idea of wanting a resemblance you know, um, again, this idea of, you know, let's make the photograph as realistic as possible, you know, wanting to live with it, wanting to make it more dimensional. Um, and you can see that the humanettes and the statuettes have a direct relationship to the photo escultures. They don't have the kind of craft. And, and, um, and there is one in the collection that's quite unusual that's from India. It's quite large and it's from India and it's the only one I've ever seen from India because I used to think that the photo esculturas and the humanettes and the, and the statuettes were just like a Mexican and American. So, you know, it will be interesting to see what surfaces from other countries in terms of immortalizing people and keepsakes. Because I think as years go by, we'll start seeing more and more of this material. Yeah. And keepsakes is certainly a major theme of the collection. And, um, you know, we've been, we've kind of been um, talking about it. It's been a, it's a, been a subtext through the um, embroidered postcards and the escultura and the statuettes, but the kind of permission and freedom of experimentation that is present in so many of these things. Um, and so 
Barbara, do you want to explain what we're looking at here? Okay, well, for this one, I'm probably going to have to look down a lot at my notes because this is very this is a fascinating history. Um, so, you know, I think as we were saying, since the beginning of time with photography, um, you know, photography, you know, as I understand it, um, you know, coming out of sort of science, if you will, and um, the um, inspired a lot of experimentation, you know, um, obviously with artists and tinkers and, you know, all kinds of people wanting to experiment, which is so interesting. So um, when Mybridge did his animal locomotion studies in the late 1800s, it inspired a lot of, um, you know, tinkerers, I, for lack of a better word, inventors, scientists, how do, how can we make photographs move without having to have an, a, a clunky apparatus? In other words, how can we sell stuff on the boardwalk? How can we sell novelties on the boardwalk and then, and the novelty of the moving picture? Um, and so it was in 1910, um, that Felsenthal and Sons in Chicago came up with this idea, which was the life motion photograph. Um, again, so thinking about technology, the relationship between technology and photography. Um, so, and actually before 1910, it was 1903. This is why I need my notes. Okay, so I'm just gonna like consult my notes. Okay, so. Remember the idea, it's a very big idea in a small package. The idea was how do you make things move and delight people, which required science and technology. Um, and how do you do this in a way that like people will buy these, right? So in 1903, the American engineer Frederick Ives invented the parallax stereogram. And that's what we're looking at. Uh, they're called parallax stereogram. So he placed a glass barrier containing a fine grid of opaque lines in front of a photographic plate, allowing two different views to be exposed directly onto a single negative. So the left eye view and the right eye view. And when the printed positive was displayed beneath the same grid, the brain resolved the left eye and the right eye images into a 3D picture with no specially, special viewing equipment. And if you ever disassemble one of these, you'll just see that it's basically, there are just these lines and you can kind of see them in the picture. So it's like this, so it's ingenious really. Um, and so uh, automatically other inventors, you know, were like, wow, you know, expanded this technology to capture multiple images on the same plate. And the novelties in the postcards in, you know, Spiegel and Felsenthal created the motion views, the film positive of the same subject, um, such as blinking eye um, or facial expressions behind a grid of lines. And so a lot of the things that maybe some of you, I know I did, the blinking eyes, these were the predecessors of those blinking, winking photographs and novelties were these, the, the one on the far, left is 1910 and then you get into 1933 and 34 um, because they the the movie of you um, was it, again more people wanting to improve on the technology uh, combine motion view technology and the souvenir um, and it goes on it goes on to even things that we enjoy today, you know, this whole idea of a not, it goes on like in the 40s and the 30s and the 40s, there was a whole movie of you and you could go into a, a special movie of you photo booth and, and, and you could get these, these souvenirs that where you would be making, you know, blinking and winking. Um, so I think these are really important because they really show early on you know, this desire to make mass produced uh, moving pictures to combine the science 
with the novelty and to give people the pleasure of seeing their face move. Um, yeah. So, so those of you familiar with lenticulars will understand that as you're looking at these thing, you know, the person is just moving very slightly. And Barbara, what was interesting to me in the 33 and 34 um, from California is that um, just how they were made, um, and I'm sure it was just a product of just having to put those two things in there very quickly, you can open them and like at yeah. how it's done. So it's like a trick on the outside and then it reveals itself on the inside, which is- Well, sometimes it's because, you know, the paper, you know, creases and, and you know, if, if any of you come across these, I encourage you to open them because they're, it's just really interesting because you're like, oh, well, it's just lines in a picture. And, but that's, you know, there is like this research and, and they were very, very popular in Europe as well. So you get a lot of like the naughty pictures and the, you know, but you can see that, you, you know, you start to think about all the ways in which uh, novelties, um, you know, they reveal a kind of history of a photography that we may not be aware of, you know, again, the, the behind the scenes or the, the, the smaller inventors and smaller scientists who, you know, are trying, are using uh, photography and motion or photography and hand coloring, or, you know, these are things now we sort of take for granted. Um, in fact, you know, I see a parallel with the apps on the phone. You know, you, you, there's all these apps now that are really about giving us pleasure in some way. They're like novelties on our phone. And, and as far as I'm concerned, these are the precursors to that. Well, you- uh, I'll let you go first. <laughs> you uh, mentioned, you know, the last um, novelties uh, even though they're meant for fun, kind of make you aware of this hidden history. And for me, this does the same. Um, this is our cowboy. We love him dearly in Houston. For many of us at the museum, this is the photo that really has become the um, symbolic one for your collection. Um, and obviously this young man, when visiting this photo studio, you see the fake backdrop behind him. And we've actually been able to trace that backdrop over several photos in your collection. Yeah. He's dressed up like a cowboy. Texas loves it. But it also, um, you know, for us recalls a history that isn't talked about nearly enough that one in four cowboys in the West was African-American that following um, the Civil War, many of the freed enslaved people became cowboys in order to move the cattle up to Kansas, um, where it would get on the train and then move west, or move east, excuse me. Um, so while this is purely play, like the previous objects, it does kind of hint at this hidden history, which is really fantastic. Barbara? I don't know. You know, it's we'll never know if this young man um, was a cowboy or if he was taking the opportunity to get his picture taken. Um, I, I, a second. As a cowboy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I do um, it. I think also this was you know John Wayne was very popular at this time when this picture was made um, and. I think that this picture, you know, we first, Paige and I first showed it um, at Cherryhurst House uh, in Houston. And we had a really interesting experience listening to people talk about this picture on all the various levels, Lisa, that you're mentioning, representation, identity, um, you know, the backdrops, the, you know, it, you know, there's more questions than answers. And it has a kind of iconic feel to it um, that is unexpected. And 
you know, I know when I first saw this picture, it made me, of all things, think of Warhol's Elvis picture. Mm. Um, and I mean, that's a stretch, but that's what I thought of. And then, of course, John Wayne. And then, of course, what you were saying about, um, you know, the history of cowboys. Also, the thing that is about these pictures w that are portraits of um, Black people is that I, I feel that the photographer was most likely also Black because of segregation. And so there's a power in these pictures that is hard to define. And I think that's part of it you know, that there's a certain way in which this young man is looking, is so comfortable looking at the camera. Um, you know, it just, it, it opens up all kinds of avenues for conversation and about photography and portraiture. Yeah, I, we love this picture. We really love this picture. Yeah. And Avenue, yeah discussion I mean this one yeah this is um you know to my read on this and I don't know if anybody else has a different read but my read on this is is that this this person looks to me like in, new to the country doesn't you know and the backdrop is is obviously the American dream and again, that that using backdrops and um, you know the house, the car, and again looking directly at the camera. Um, this is also for me a very powerful picture um, because it it just speaks to all these different layers in photography: real, imagined, um, the in between spaces. You know, these are not, we will never know like we know today in portraiture. In fact, we see portraits today and, and, and there's very little left to the imagination. I mean, everything is explained and contextualized. Whereas these pictures, you know, we'll never know. Um, but I see a direct relationship between pictures like this and contemporary portraits that are being made today. Yeah. And the hand coloring also just is so rough, um, but it adds to the appeal of this. I mean, you can see in the sky how the green of the trees has migrated out um, into the sky and the, the red of the brick has moved over into the bench. And But somehow all those kind of little errors make the whole stronger. Yeah, um, and I think it's because of the relationship between the subject and the photographer. Yeah. I mean, there's a kind of presence there. Yeah. Um, that's it's very powerful. Yeah. <laughs> Lisa, I think this is one of your favorite pictures. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I, I'm going to back up. Um, Barbara and Paige together have put a lot of amazing books together from the collection that you can all go buy right now and I would highly suggest them. Um, people fishing, people knitting, um, people kissing, which is always a favorite around Valentine's Day. And the one that got away, the one that they didn't get to make, but I get to enjoy because it's kind of fully packaged in a binder for me, is people smoking, um, which is a very common theme in vernacular photography. And as I was going through the people smoking binder, this image just leapt out at me. And when we were talking about this um, presentation and we refer to the one on the left as the American dream, um, then the one on the right becomes the American reality because you just have this frazzled housewife. She's out in the middle of I don't know where smoking, baby on her hip, dog jumping on her, could care less that she is being photographed at that moment. And all together, it's just this hilarious, but really telling moment. And so I, you know, it's, it is one of my favorites. The minute I it's saw- all about, It's all about that cigarette break. You know, the only time 
that you get a moment to yourself in that realm, which I think a lot of us can relate to. Um, yeah, we, we love pictures of people smoking for, for all the reasons of striking a pose and the iconic imagery that we're inundated with, not so much anymore, um, but all the characters that people take on um, and all the emotions that people show um, when they're smoking. And I, I hope one day that we can do something with all those pictures because because combined, they, re they really, um, uh, you know, they, they just bring up all of the ways in which we, um, the props that we use basically. But uh, just this picture, I love that her hand is out of focus and that you can see the smoke and, and the baby is looking at the dog and the dog is just like, come on, let's go. And, so that's again, you know, it's like this perfect it, it, chaos. Yes, exactly. Perfect chaos. Well said. Uh, yes. Who knew? Anybody out there know about the press photographer game? Uh, Flash. <laughs> um, this was, uh, you know, just a wonderful example of the role of photography in everyday life. Um, this was made by Shelcho and Ryder, also made um, Scrabble and Parcheesi. So I just love the fact that they felt like photography was important enough. And also this was made in the 40s. And it's hard not to think that it was in some way informed by Ouija. Who, um, and um, let me see, I think I, have, I think I have the instructions. Oh, yes. Yeah. So the goal of the game, right. So the ga this game was created in 1956. Um, South John Riders based in New York. Um, that's why I'm sticking my neck out and making the Ouija, you know, connection. Um, okay, so you're, you're playing this game. You're a newspaper reporter. Um, there's assignment cards. You're racing around New York City trying to get photographs of the day's big stories. Um, you're working for a paper called the Daily Globe and you're on the telephone or you're racing around and you must move your piece, your game pieces to the right, correct location to take the picture and you're racing against the deadline to meet your, your, meet your editor, to meet your deadline. Um, so, I mean, how great is this? The graphic itself is just amazing. Um, and again, I like that in the, those letters flash, you know, you have text, yeah. you know? So again, the, the relationship between picture words and pictures um, and you know photography is is such an such a part of our lives that there's a game that you you can play and pretend that you're a press photographer i just love this <laughs> can't wait to play yeah <laughs> Um, some of the treasures in the collection, uh, you know, as you mentioned, when seeing our uh, amazing cowboy that you immediately thought of Warhol's Elvis, there are some individual prints in the collection that when you see, you cannot help yourself from thinking about other artists, other photographers, and these are two of the examples. Yeah, the, uh, the, the comment that I get most about these two, especially, is that they remind people of Arbus. Um, and I think for those, if, if, you've, if, you, if you've studied photography, then it, it's, a, it's a known to you. But if you haven't, then I'll, I'll just say a little bit about that here, which is that photographers like Diane Arbus and Lisette Modell and William Eggleston and a whole host of others um, were really deeply influenced by the snapshot aesthetic. And so it, you know, when you see pictures like this and you think of Arbus, I think that's right because, you know, you, you can think of that uh, iconic Arbus photograph of the little boy with the grenade or other things that you might have seen. And, you know, the bizarre, the strange, but the very, you know, human. Um, and so one of the things I particularly like about snapshots, which are 
a part of the collection is that so when you find those snapshots that you just feel like, I feel like Paige, you know, we talk about this a lot. We, you just know that you, the, the influence when that you're seeing in contemporary work or modern work, you can see the, the relationship to the snapshots. You, you can see how, yes, exactly, how snapshots have permeated and influenced, inspired, you know, other photographers. Yeah, and so I'm showing you now um, those two snapshots paired with two Arbus prints from the collection. And this is exactly how we intend to use this collection. We are not planning to do any siloed exhibition of this material, um, but rather in our consistent history of photography presentations, we always have a new one every six months at the museum. We plan to integrate this material to put these kind of snapshots side by side with an Arbus and talk about that relationship because we feel like that is what gives the full picture of the history of photography, not separating snapshots from art. That doesn't do it for us. You know, that was, I'll share with, with all of you and that are watching. I mean, that was very important to me and to Paige was that, um, you know, I had always had this pet fantasy project. Oh, I would love to put, make a, a, an exhibition and there's no labels and, and you're experiencing the photo for how you're experiencing the photo, not because of who made it. Um, and, and both of both Paige and I feel that that's a very powerful example um, to, to look at pictures and to, to realize that things are in dialogue with each other, whether you know about it or you don't know about it. Yeah. And just, you know, to continue on this line, there are other, there are millions of pairings that we've thought of already, but, um, you know, this folded, ripped, and then taped back together because it was something precious um, photograph on the left from Barbara and Page's collection. And on the right, a contemporary Canadian photographer named Sandra Brewster, who's creating work thinking about exactly that thing the photographs that are so precious to us that we carry with us that become bruised and damaged and broken and, and, you know, rubbed away in certain points. So again, it's this um, conversation back and forth that we are so excited to um, get started. Yeah. Yeah, this, um, it's just amazing to me, you know, like the one on the left, I love you, I hate you, I love you, I hate you, you know, I'm ripping it up, or maybe it was folded up, and then it, you know, got so creased, and then the effort to tape it, and then the tape is yellowing, and, um, you know, I, 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 like some of you may feel like you're, you're an artist yourself who is interested in surface wear and detail, and how do you express aging, and like a kind of patina on the photograph. And so you have artists that are like burying their negatives or burying their photographs or ripping them up or, you know, doing all kinds of things to suggest aging. And so I, you know, my hope um, is that when, you know, you see something like this that has survived, um, that it's inspiring, that, that it has a kind of power that again speaks to contemporary sensibilities. And that's very exciting to me that these, um, you know, vintage images, these vintage objects can speak to contemporary sensibilities and can be on equal footing with contemporary sensibilities. Yeah, absolutely. This is a great example. I mean, you know, this could have been made by somebody today. It's so, searing and, you know, just raw. Um, th this, this, this picture just, it's like a sucker punch to the gut. Um, I mean, I don't really know what is going on here. Um, you know, why, or, you know, again, it brings up all these questions, but the powerful relationship between words and pictures and that people feel a permission, they have felt a permission with photography, unlike other mediums, 
to, you know, really kind of make the photograph by, you know, writing on it, ripping it, you know, embroidering it, collaging it. Um, th there is a language of photography that is hugely adaptable to people's personal needs and to, you know, the just adaptable. Photography is so adaptable on, on so many different levels. And this, so besides being to me, a work of art, this, this picture is, is diaristic and it's, um, I don't think there's any woman on the planet that cannot relate to having a day like this picture, you know, expresses. And the uh, relationship between text and image is a strong theme that runs through the whole collection. And for me, it's so fascinating because we tend to believe the old adage that a picture is worth a thousand words. But when we see how people are actually using photography on a daily basis and the need to add words to the photo to further contextualize or further explain or further personalize, it just makes you realize, you know, it's never been this factual thing or this like, you know, very obvious thing. We've always needed to explain it or personalize it no matter what it is, um, be it a horrifying photo postcard, we're gonna personalize it on the other side um, when we send it to somebody. So, yeah, well, this is, this is a big shift, but to your point about uh, the relationship between words and pictures. So what we're looking at is uh, a photograph uh, made by uh, William Horn, um, or was it William or Walter? Walter, well, yes, Walter. This is why I have my notes. Um, Walter Horn, um, Mexican Revolution um, photograph. And um, there's a lot you can say. The Mex Mexican Revolution was the first photographed war. So that's significant. Um, and postcard, postcard sales were dropping. Postcard publishers were looking for ways to sell more postcards. They were looking for sensational, sensational topics. Um, itinerant photograph photographers were jumping over to Mexico. Um, Walter Horn was the most notable of them. He actually relocated um, uh, penniless from Maine uh, to El Paso, Texas, uh, expressly for the purpose of making photographs of the Mexican Revolution that he could sell to publishers. And what's really interesting, especially in the context of, you know, the summit, you know, uh, the summit and the discussions that have been going on as part of this two-day uh, Medium Photo Summit event is that many of these pictures were staged. Um, Horn would stage execution scenes. He would stage, I don't know what this one was staged. There are others in the collection that have been researched. Um, uh, by others, not me, but by actually Mexican Revolution historians that are staged, all for the purposes of uh, selling um, postcards because many of Pershing's soldiers that came over, they had nothing to do except buy postcards and send them home. And then you have this horrific scene on the postcard of dead bodies and you turn it around and it's like, Hi, Edith, how is everything, Bob? I mean, it, to me, that the fact that these images were even going through the mail, you can't not help but draw a line to what we're all experiencing today with this topic of fake news, with this topic of the, in, the kinds of images that are on you know, the internet. It's not new. It, you know, if you if you start looking at things in the in this collection, especially with the real photo postcards of the Mexican Revolution, you'll see that this manipulation of photography um, and using it a, as an exchange with publishers and and then you know obviously some people like Bob you know not really getting it that you know he's sending Edith like a photograph of dead bodies, 
you know, it just, it all conjures up that um, there are direct lines between, you know, the date of this photograph, 19, what is it, 1917 or 1911? Anyway, and now is my point. Well, you know, from postcards that were sent to a limited amount of people to these more mass um, representations of photography and photographers. Um, this is an amazing part of the collection, these nine camera comics um, that I cannot wait to dive into. Any camera comic, let me see which one it is. I can't find it. That it just refers to William Henry Fox Talbot as William Talbot and get out of here is like, you know, I'm, I'm in, I'm ready to read them. Um, and they're beautiful things um, on top of that. Um, so Barbara's going to teach you all a little bit about Linda Lenz here. Oh, yes. Well, these uh, were a comic rarity. There were only nine issues of Camera Comics produced between 1944 and 1946. Um, and there were characters, there was Kid Click, and then there was the photographer that was the insurance agent, and then there was the, the war aerial photographer that you see in uh, issue number one. But then there was also Linda Lenz, and she was the only, the first female action photographer um, character created, which if you're thinking about 1944 to 46, radical, and um, must have been, based on people like Dorothea Lang, you know, because it was again, Life, Life, Mag it was, Life Magazine was out by then, right? Right, that's right, yes. Okay, so anyway, my point is that um, these comic books were, you know, they were all about the war, um, you know, you had like these hideous covers with, you know, featuring Japanese or, you know, um, during World War II with, you know, the Nazis, and it was all about using, using your camera and not your gun to defeat crime, um, to get the bad guy, use your camera. Um, and so there, there are a lot of ads in these comic books. Um, and, you know, one of them is um, snapshots at night that mean bad days for the jobs. You know, it was all about, you um, you know, selling cameras and selling film and encouraging especially boys to become photographers. So again, this thread throughout history of this uh, starting with uh, George Eastman of always kind of marketing and the, the, the have a career in photography. Um, and they really used the war as a way to, as an umbrella for all of these facets um, to bring them all together. But essentially it was about, you know, selling cameras and selling um, the idea of photography as a part, an important part of life and that could save your life, which is fascinating. Um, and so, you know, the, the, once the war was over, you know, of course, photo buffs and boys turned more to superheroes like Atomic Age and Captain America and things like that. But these are gems and there are a lot of examples. I happen to love comic books and, um, and since I love photography, there are many examples in the collection of where photography is the subject of the comic book. Um, and there's some really wonderful examples of female photographers um, who probably got more play in comic books than they did anywhere else at, at that time. So yeah, these are great. I can't wait for them to be shared with the wider audience because I think, you know, unless you know about them, which I don't know how you would unless you're an obsessive collector page and I know some of you out there who are also collectors know about these but most people do not so they're real fun and serious very serious at the same time yeah and speaking of fun and serious at the same time um this amazing sheet um it's both front and back I'm only showing you one view um and if you can read that 
Yes, you are reading it correctly. This is a order sheet, shall, shall we say, of mail order brides. Um, you have their image on the left and text on the right. And from what little research I've been able to do, uh, the concept of mail order brides is older than our country itself. We had to import brides um, for the men in Jamestown because there were not enough women to go around. And at a certain point when photography became cheap and available enough, the term was actually interchangeable with picture brides because you would see oh, that's, right. that's right. I've always been calling it mail order, but picture brides makes a lot more sense. Picture brides. So yeah. this is an example. Um, we're still dating it, but seems like late 19th century, very early 20th century to me. And I'll just read you the one on the bottom because I find it so hilarious. Um, a bright, well-formed girl, five feet, eight inches tall, weight 150 pounds, age 21, dark brown hair and eyes almost black, is a vocalist and a musician, claims to be an heiress, only men of kind disposition need right. Well, <laughs> I mean, you know, it's kind of like the Tinder of its time, I suppose, <laughs> right? I mean, but again, my point of, you know, representing yourself with a picture and with words, you know, it's sort of circulating out there. Um, it may have been posted on at the post office, you know? Um, I'm not sure how these circulated, really. Um, there were companies that specialized in oh, cool. lights. Well, yeah, the, uh, I, was, I was telling you, Lisa, that um, I found this quite by accident. Um, I, I, you know, I love so many things. You get that by now, but, you know, cigar boxes, and, uh, and uh, I got a little cigar box and um, I didn't really examine it until months later. And it was one of those holiday cigar boxes, you know, very ornate. And then you, you open it and, and there's like tissue paper and I lifted the tissue paper and this was in it. So it was, it was like, what, this is amazing. <laughs> it came to you because it, it knew that you would appreciate it. Yeah. So that, I think those are the, I think we've reached our time. Um, well, but we do have one special announcement. Oh, right. That's right. That's right. It, on the topic of matchmaking and text and image combining, we do have a special announcement and you all are really the first to hear of this. So that's kind of exciting. Um, we were so thrilled about um, the acquisition of Barbara and Paige's collection here in, at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, and we understand it's going to be interesting and attractive to so many people out there that we have, thanks to Dallas McNamara, um, the owner of Cherryhurst House, have been able to establish the Cherryhurst House Fellowship at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. Um, the fellowship requires that a team of one artist and one writer apply together to come and just investigate the Barbara Levine and Paige Ramey collection here at, in Houston alongside any other prints in the collection you may desire. Um, in that team proposal, we're not asking you to have a common project. We're not really asking you to work together at all. We just want you to be in the room with these amazing objects and have someone to talk to about them. <laughs> um, two different points of view on this incredible um, collection that's just such, you know, it's so fruitful for both writers and artists. We cannot wait to share it. Um, we will announce the details of the fellowship um, in late December or early January. And COVID willing, we are hoping to welcome our first duo to the Works on Paper study room, which you see here on the right. Um, big, beautiful open space where we just get to look at photographs all day. 
Um, we hope to welcome that first duo in the spring. Yay! So, <laughs> I've seen a lot of questions pop up as we've been going. So Scott, do you want to shoot some of those our way? Sure, happy to. Um, yeah, I, uh, I want to be mindful of time, especially the two of you being around dinner time. And also we're right at about an hour, but you know, I have to say that the, um, the amount of enthusiasm, both in questions and comments and chat and stuff is, is really wonderful. So um, as if you guys are okay, giving a, a little bit of time for Q and A, I think that that would be yeah. great. Um, my pleasure, my pleasure. One, uh, one thing I'll start with is yesterday, uh, we had Becky Semph give a lecture on Ansel Adams. And there was a question that kind of relates to this um, about whether the Center for Creative Photography acquired Ansel Adams' personal snapshots or if he even made it. And it's something that Becky's gonna look into with the family. Um, I hope to hear the answer uh, because I started to think in the, in the intervening 24 hours, um, maybe this is the next PhD on Ansel Adams. I don't know, right? I, I'm, being a bit facetious, because um, I don't know that there would be that much information there. But um, I, I wanted to kind of link those two and also just to encourage people to use the Q&A if you do have questions. Um, we do have a couple um, that I'll look at. One of them goes back to the original uh, slide with the photo ID badges, um, which was just a simple curiosity about the one on the top left had the eyes, it looked like they were cut out. Yeah, yeah. If you knew why. Um, I believe that that is a salesman sample. Oh. So, yeah, I, I, I think that's what that's about. Uh -huh. yeah. It is one of the more mysterious ones in the collection. And I should say, um, uh, Houston is about to open our new, brand new Nancy and Rich Kinder building for modern and contemporary art. We'll have a dedicated photography galleries for the first time in our museum's history. And one of the large installations is kind of just portraits from all over. And we've included a giant selection from Barbara and Page's collection, mm -hmm. a lot of photo ID badges. And we kind of put that one front and center because we know it, it, it's small, but it attracts your attention really quickly. Uh -huh. That's great. Um, there's also just a lot of comments about the enthusiasm of the two of you. I just want to share that because it, it, it is so, <laughs> so infectious and just, it's, it's been a pleasure. Um, there's quite a few questions also about how you found these photographs. And I think that might be just a kind of good general, like maybe when, when you started or if you're still acquiring um, or just the general, you know, where do you come across stuff like this? Um, well, I mean, what I can say to that, because of course it's a li lifelong answer. Um, I come from, I, you know, I started collecting things when I was a kid, like a lot of obsessive collectors. And uh, my thing was photograph albums. I started with photograph albums. Um, you know, I, I love books. And so I loved when I was a kid, the turning the pages. Like you were, every time you turned a page of an album, you were activating a story. I loved that. Um, and uh, so at that time it was, you know, I was, uh, when I was a kid, I was dragged around to antique stores by my mother and my grandmother. They were collectors, um, you know, China, sterling silver, gigas, things like that. And, um, you know, the only thing you could really touch in antique stores was photographs because they didn't break. So while they were, you know, all ooing and eyeing, I, you know, I'm an only child, so I was sort of left to do what I was gonna do. And the stuff was just usually piled in the corner and, you know, uh, not really valued at that time. And um, so I would amuse myself by looking at a lot of pictures and then um, started going to flea markets and garage sales and, you know, I, I, I put myself through uh, art school buying and selling stuff that I had learned about from my mother and my grandmother. 
and you know you're out there at you know four and five in the morning and there's like piles of photo the photographs nobody really had the patience they still don't have the patience most people don't have the patience to sort through it's you know it can be backbreaking work and it's dark and you know it's not very glamorous and um so you, you know, you add up the years and, you know, I've been doing this a long time finding stuff and then along comes eBay and it's like, ah, you know, you can be at every flea market, every, you know, and, and now with COVID um, and everybody being online, it's like a flea market every day of the week as far as everybody sort of adapting to doing everything online. So um, I would say that the majority of how Paige and I have found them is through our travels and, and eBay. And I mean, I'm, I'm obsessive. I'm obsessed with photography. I've always been obsessed with photography. I love it. I love everything about it. And so for me, you know, it's like the game or the comic book or the pictures. Um, and I think I'll always be a collector because obviously, I mean, I don't, you know, I think I would I don't know who I would be if I wasn't a photographer, but it's a joy. So um, what I would collect now, uh, you know, I'm, you know, I, 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 I don't know, I'm going through a whole transition now as a result of this, the, you know, the sharing the collection in the very best of ways. Um, so I still look at everything. I love looking at pictures. It's like my favorite thing to do in the whole world. So I would say if you want to find pictures, if you're interested in collecting pictures, it's, it's a wonderful world. Um, and eBay online, there are some like great, wonderful dealers there out there that have integrity and a lot of artists uh, collect, a lot of writers collect because it inspires characters or artists collect because, you know, it's, it's just, it's like I said, it's, it's intelligence and pleasure combined. Uh, a simple question. When did the, the Museum of Fine Arts acquire the collection? Is that 2020 or a different year? Um, you know, we've been working on the acquisition for probably about a full year, but we, Signed all the paperwork early this year. Okay. It's fresh. It's very yeah. fresh. It's very fresh. We just finished photographing the last object wow. of 5,000 yesterday. So yeah, it's all going to be online. How great is that? The whole collection is going to be online. That is, that's really amazing. There are a couple other questions um, also, sort of more specific ones. Is there morning jewelry? Uh, in the collection? Yes, there are um, um, the, the button, you know, when we were talking about the ID badges, yes, so there are uh, buttons um, that are more what I would describe as morning jewelry. There's some really beautiful, there's like a really, what comes to mind is a very beautiful Victorian brooch. Um, yep. Yeah. And the rings. Oh, yeah, the rings. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> sometimes she she there's so much i have to remind you yeah. no i love it all <laughs> wow. um are there daguerreotypes in the collection you know there's a lot of daguerreotype jewelry and it's, it's you, know, I, you know I, I will say that unlike many collectors i don't Paige and i have never collected by format um you know it's really the subject matter or the composition or how it hits us or like Lisa, you were explaining what it makes us think of or how it relates to other things. So um, there may be a few daguerreotypes, but they're not exceptional as daguerreotypes as much as they really are about being a part of uh, a, an important thread about right. something. I think we have what, uh, I think, Sure. There are 15 cased images total, um, but not, those aren't strictly daguerreotypes, but about encased images. And then of course, like little gem tintypes or a little larger tintypes are spread throughout. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there are some, well, these aren't daguerreotypes, but you know, there's some old albums where the tintypes have been pasted in, things like that. Mm -hmm. 
I think, I think, well, there is, I think the oldest picture is what, 1860? Hmm. Yeah, of a man holding a fish in a studio. I just love that. Like, he's holding a fish inside a photography studio. <laughs> okay. Um, one more question, and I think it's probably a good time to wrap up. Are there any of uh, your collages, you and Paige, the collages you've made, are those part of this collection or uh, something separate entirely? Oh, no, no, they're not. They're not. We're very attached to those. <laughs> I can understand that. Yeah, no, we're not ready to part with those. Yeah. But thank you for asking. Thank yeah. you for well, asking. The, the question came very, in. I, 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 obviously, they're very influenced by everything we're talking about. But Yeah, yeah. That's great. Well, I want to thank you both. Um, this has been such an amazing pleasure. Uh, I've been looking forward to this as I look forward to most things that have anything to do with photography. But, um, but you know, this is really, it's, it's a, such a unique subject and it's one that doesn't get talked about probably as much as it should. And what a great opportunity. Yeah, and I, I agree. So I feel like this is the time to start talking about it. Yeah. You know, because this is the time to expand our understanding of representation and identity. And photography is a part of our lives. There is no aspect of our lives that isn't affected by photography. So this is the time to really talk about all of photography, um, you know, what it is and what it can be. So thank you very much for inviting us. To of talk course. About. Yeah, thank you all. Um, we'll go ahead and wrap up. Very, very grateful for everything. And I hope everybody has a great night. And I will say, if you want to see more, I'm on Instagram. I post almost every day. Project. Oh, tell B us, what, what's your Instagram handle? It's Project B Photos. OK. And that's P-H-O-T-O-S photos? Correct. And you great. can always message me and ask me questions if you want to. I'm, I'm sure the, uh, your inbox will start to get filled soon. Okay, thank okay. you. Okay, thank you both. Okay, bye now. Bye-bye.